Thank you very much for the invitation and for those I understand about half the group is from here and half the group is visiting. Uh, welcome to all. What I'd like to do is, uh, I've, I've kind of three goals for the next 45 minutes or so. First, I'd like to kind of contextualize your experience here in the city going back 300 years, um, both historically and geographically, how all these patterns have woven together, giving us the city today. Second, I'd like to kind of catch you up on what's been going on the past, what now, 34 months since, since Katri Katrina, a little bit of a progress report. And then third, I looked over your agenda and uh, noticed a number of um, uh, kind of design related, map related, uh, geography, in my opinion, related uh, uh, activities that you've been doing. And I'm hoping that some of the spatial analysis and, and map making and cartography and, and graphical data presentation uh, that, that I do here might be uh, useful for, for you, sort of giving you some ideas. So let's um, go back. Now, when I say geography, I'm not just talking about physical geography. I'm also talking about human geography. That is the way humans have dispersed themselves across this landscape, how they've manipula man manipulated and tinkered with the landscape. There is geography, human geography, going on right in this room right now. There's a physical geography, the way the tables and chairs have been set up, the floor, the building, uh, certain areas that are more convenient, some areas that are maybe more or less comfortable, and there's also a human geography. Uh, you've distributed yourselves in a certain way here. Uh, whenever I um, teach my urban geography class, uh, on the first day of class, I make a point of arriving early and I set up my projector and everything in one part of the room. And as students start trickling in, unbeknownst to them, I map them. And I put one, two, three, four, five in order in PowerPoint with the projector off, and I map out how they start to fill the room. And then at the end of the class, we start talking about the uh, urban geography of hazards versus risks versus environmental nuisances and how this affects property values and how it ends up affecting uh, human distributions by class and race and other factors. And then I show the example. And sure enough, the room almost always starts to fill up from the most convenient, wherever the entrance is, from the back. And those arriving late have the misfortune of sitting right next to me up front. So that we, we, we create a little city with all, the, you know, and it's uh, quite analogous to the way uh, an actual city works. And the kids really get a kick out of it because it's sort of their story. It's, it happened right in real time. So, so we're going to start with physical geography and then we'll get to the human geography. And it's impossible to understand this place without um, understanding its geological origins. So if we take the North American continent here and we look at all the drainage basin that contributes water to this river coming out here, about a million square miles stretching from New York all the way to Montana to New Mexico. Uh, now, if you were here 18 to 20,000 years ago at the peak of the Ice Age, glaciers would have formed about as far south as Cairo, Illinois. All of this would have been ice sheets. Global temperatures then started to rise. The ice sheets melted. But by that time, those ice sheets had sort of re-sculpted the topography and the hydrology of the North American continent such that as they receded, you have drastically increased flow coming down the Ohio and the Missouri rivers and conflowing at Cairo and then down the Mississippi, the lower Mississippi River. Now the Gulf of Mexico at that, at, at that time traced a smooth arc. So all of southern Louisiana, pretend that's, that's in the Gulf of Mexico. So you have this um, slow moving, very uh, sediment laden water body coming down, all of a sudden it hits the slack water of the Gulf of Mexico. It loses its kinetic energy and it starts to dump out its sediment load. And so a, a sheet of alluvium starts to accumulate at the edge of the North American continent. This is only about seven to 10,000 years ago, fairly recent geologically. So this alluvium is piling up to the point that the river itself can no longer go through its own delta. And so it leans over to the side and it forms another lobe over here. Meanwhile, the first one is no longer being sustained by the river and so it starts to subside into the sea. So the second one is building up. The river, every spring with snow melt, exceeds its banks and deposits the majority of its coarsest sediment, sand. There's not a single natural rock in this entire area. They're too heavy to make it all the way down the river. So the only sediment we have is sand, 
silt, which is much smaller than the particle size of a sand, and then clay particles, which are even smaller. So the majority of the sand gets deposited first and builds up the areas closest to the river highest, and then silt is deposited next, and then finally clay particles last. So instead of water carving down, as you see um, in an erosional environment, in the mountains, in the, in the southwest, here water builds up land. The areas closest to the river, counterintuitively, are the highest. The areas farther from the river or bayous or other freshwater uh, bodies are the lowest. Every now and then a crack, a crevasse, will open up in these higher lands, and they're called natural levees. And through that crevasse, the river will shoot a distributary, so not a tributary, but a distributary out. And every now and then, so much water will go out that distri distributary that it seizes the entire channel and the river jumps in yet a third direction. So when we zoom in on this area here in southwestern Louisiana, this is where, over about 7,000 years, that those various deltaic lobes have kind of wandered across as the river exits its, its alluvial valley. And by alluvial valley, I mean these very slight terraces here, all of 10 to 20 feet uh, above the surrounding terrain, but enough to theoretically constrain the river. Once it's out of there, it could and it did swing pretty much anywhere. And this formed the deltaic plain. That when we say the Louisiana deltaic plain, that's what we mean. Uh, so again, five to 7,000 years. Uh, this is based on a couple of research projects from the mid 20th century. These have since been refined by actual field data. Uh, but uh, the long and short of it is this is a very dynamic, fluid, delicate, thin, flat terrain. Only five to 7,000 years. Now think about that. We have oak trees in this city that are almost 500 years old. So 500, that means we have living things that are 10% the age of the underlying geology. That's how fluid and dynamic and youthful this is. You introduce human beings into the story, and human beings don't want to deal with dynamic nature. We don't like fluidity. We don't like seasonal floods. And so what we've done over 300 years is imposed rigidity and levees and canals and control on this. And the, consequence, the environmental consequences of that are part of the story that led to the Katrina catastrophe. So now let's zoom in on uh, the southwestern part. New Orleans is right here, the mouth of the river. And let's start to introduce human beings into the story. Um, it's problematic to start with the European arrival. This was a significantly humanized environment during prehistoric times. A surprisingly high indigenous um, population here that aligns with recent research of the past about 20 or 30 years that, that increases the, the general perception of how many indigenous peoples there were in the Americas prior to European arrival and the amount of impact that they had on the, um, on the environment in terms of tinkering and uh, burning fields and agriculture. By the time the first Europeans arrived, a couple of Spanish explorers, most significantly De Soto, uh, kind of brushed by this area in the 1500s and uh, made no lasting settlements. Um, 150 years later, late 1600s, the French by that time were well established in French Canada, in Quebec and Montreal, and then well established in the Caribbean, particularly uh, Saint-Domingue, which is present-day Haiti. And so uh, there was a mystery of how these two areas were enjoined and how they related to each other. That was solved by Robert LaSalle, who in 1682 rather easily came down from the Great Lakes, down the upper Mississippi, down the lower Mississippi, and in April reached the, the mouth. He knew this because he could start tasting salt water, and disembarked right where the, the delta forms over here, turns around, plants the flag, and claims the entire, every area that drained water into that river in the name of France, and he names it after King Louis, and hence Louisiana enters the vocabulary. So in his mind, all of this million square miles, and of course they didn't realize it was a million square miles, now belong to France. So he's very excited about this. He realizes that there's only one way in and out of this, this vast terrain, and that is by establishing some sort of fort or settlement on the lower river. Goes back to France, excited about this possibility. He gets the charge to found this city. He comes back, 
Now this would have been, it wouldn't have been called New Orleans, but this was the first vision of the idea that became New Orleans 40 years later. He comes back, he can't find the delta. It's very different trying to go find it from here than to just float down here. This is a foggy, labyrinthian environment. There's all sorts of bays and bayous and inlets and outlets. It's very confusing. It's strewn with logs and debris and mud, mud lumps. He drifts with the longshore current. He crashes, like I almost just did, uh, in coastal Texas. It's a complete disaster. He's, his own crew, mass, uh, um, is a, uh, a, a mutiny, and his own crew murders him two years later. And uh, did I knock this off kilter here? And not until 1995 did archaeologists find his ship as well as that little fort that they established in Matagorda de Bay, uh, Texas, not too far from Beaumont. So Louisiana kind of falls off the French radar screen, so to speak, for another 15 years. By the late seven, uh, 1690s, France is increasingly concerned about the English who are on the coast, the, the east coast, and coming down from Appalachia, and then the Spanish who are in Texas and are in Mexico. And they realize that La Salle was right, we better seize this or lose it. So 1699, they send the Lemoyne brothers, Iberville and his younger brother, Bienville, 19 years old, Bienville, to start establishing a French colonial society on the Gulf Coast and the Lower Mississippi River. They establish a couple of very lackluster settlements in, uh, on the Mississippi Gulf Coast in Alabama, but they both realize that the real prize is to figure out a way to establish a, uh, a settlement on this very dynamic um, natural levee of the Mississippi River. There's a problem, though. If you try to go from those existing settlements up the river, you have to go 100 miles across open ocean, open gulf, find, penetrate the mouth, and then go against the current and oftentimes against the wind. Even if the wind is helping you, you hit English turn here, now the wind is against you. You could sit for weeks in English turn waiting for favorable uh, conditions to finally make it up the river. So the indigenous people show them a really neat trick. And that is you could take this shortcut through the protected waters of um, the Mississippi Sound, Lake Bourne, the Wrigley's, which is a little channel over here, Lake Pontchartrain, across Lake Pontchartrain, up a little bayou called Bayou St. John, which is still there. You disembark right around mid-city, the mid-city area, and then there's a very slight topographic ridge that we, today we call the Esplanade Ridge. This is under Esplanade Avenue. You walk two miles and you're at the river. So that is the perfect place to establish a sediment. It's a portage route. There's lots of cities uh, along portage route. Chicago is a good example. Um, so it was a least cost, minimum distance way of connecting that entire worlds that communicated with the Caribbean and France itself and Latin America and Africa with that northern frontier which connected with New France. And so this is where Bienville, the younger of the two brothers, this is eight, uh, eight, 19 years later, he's 38 years old, this is 1718, he establishes New Orleans at uh, where that Esplanade Ridge meets the natural levee of the, the river. This is the highest area around. Um, and that is today's French Quarter. So when you walk around tomorrow, you're walking in that original grid uh, that is uh, 290 years old. So the original population clustered in that area. There were a few along Bayou Road, Esplanade Ridge, a couple along the crest of the river, but almost everyone lived in that inner city. So at this point, I'd like to talk a little a bit about these notions of site versus situation. After Katrina, it became uh, a topic of international interest. How did this great city get to be located on such a problematic and, and dangerous site? Uh, well, we have to distinguish between site and situation. Site means the actual literal real estate that you're on, the, your, the, the literal footing beneath the buildings, uh, buildings. Situation means how that site relates and interconnects with the rest of the world. So in terms of site, this is a very troubled site. Soft so soils, no bedrock, uh, existentially linked to flooding, prone to uh, mosquitoes, prone to uh, swamp water, hurricanes, high winds, etc. But in terms of situation, 
this was a fantastic location for a city because it connected that vast interior with all those hinterlands at a time when humanity depended almost entirely on waterborne transportation for long distance movement. So much of the story of New Orleans over the past 300 years has been figuring out ways of protecting that site so that you could take advantage of that fantastic situation. We have lots of examples of, uh, well, let me ask you, what's an example of a city that is on a fantastic site as well as a fantastic situation? In other words, good, good solid footing and great s strategic nature. Yeah, Manhattan, New York City is probably the best example. Solid bedrock, skyscrapers, deep draft harbor, perfect access to Europe. Um, how about an example of a city that is on a, or a human community, let me put it that way, that is on um, a very good site, but a not so good situation? Not very strategic, but, you know, they're safe, it doesn't flood, no earthquakes. We have thousands of, ex of examples. We call them small towns, right? Now, there are some small towns that unfortunately have bad sites and bad situations, but uh, most of them, uh, you know, they, they might do well in this regard, but because they're not strategically wired into the rest of the economic and transportation networks, they never become great. So what's fascinating about New Orleans and Venice and a couple of other very few places is that they're in this kind of Shakespearean situation of they have to exist, but it is a struggle to exist. And, um, and, and so that's kind of the, the backdrop that I'd like you to have you keep in your mind as we go through this here. So despite the uh, excellence of this situation, New Orleans during the colonial era, it was French for the first 40 years. When the French lost the French and Indian War, it switched to the Spanish and adjacent areas became British. So most of the, the 18th century, 1718 up until the Louisiana Purchase, it was a colonial city and you could almost think of it as sort of a colonial orphan, an afterthought. Spain was doing much better with its Mesoamerican and Latin American colonies. France was, uh, was distracted with other issues. Louisiana was not seen as very promising. This is one of the French Quarter maps that you'll probably be looking at in the next session. By the way, here's Bayou St. John. This is a little bit of a fanciful view here. Here's Bayou St. John, here's Bayou Road, which still exists to this day on the, the Esplanade Ridge, connects with the city, and then here's the river. So things start to change for New Orleans at the very end of the 1700s. And within 20 years, the city's destiny is dramatically reversed. It starts in an odd way. 1791, there is a slave insurrection in St. Domingue, present day Haiti. Two years later, the cotton gin is invented, uh, patented in Georgia. And this has the effect, rather quickly, of making cotton production much more economical. It, uh, the, the gin or engine removes the lint from the seed very efficiently, and now you can make a lot of money in cotton. Two years after that, right here in present-day Audubon Zoo, a technique to granulate, uh, granulate Louisiana sugarcane is perfected. Now, sugarcane, you squeeze out the juice, you boil it, you send it through about a 10-step process, and you turn it into exportable sugar uh, uh, grain, you know, like you have on the table here. Uh, that was perfected in the tropical Caribbean environment, but this is a semi-tropical environment. We do have freezes here. It was a lot more complicated. That was done two years later, so within two years, not only was cotton a lot more lucrative, but sugar was much more lucrative. And all of this, you're on a former plantation now. Everything from the French Quarter all the way up beyond Baton Rouge, below the French Quarter all the way almost to the Delta was plantations. In the 1700s, they would have been tobacco, indigo, vegetables. Within about 10 years, everything above uh, Baton Rouge became cotton and everything below became sugar. They only had one way to ship all these commodities out, and that was to transship it New Orleans and then to the rest of the world. So you start to see how New Orleans is in a strategic position here. In 1802, the slave insurrection triumphs in Saint-Domingue. Haiti becomes the second independent country in the Western Hemisphere. Napoleon at the time, Saint-Domingue was so lucrative that the French, uh, Napoleon, all he cared about was that sugar colony. He saw all of Louisiana as nothing but a breadbasket feeding Saint-Domingue. So upon losing Saint-Domingue, he loses interest in uh, Louisiana. 
the Americans at this time. Jefferson, the country is expanding into the Ohio and Upper Mississippi Valley. They're interested in buying New Orleans. Napoleon ends up selling them not only New Orleans, but all of the Louisiana colony. 1803, the Louisiana Purchase is signed in the Cabildo. It becomes an American city, an American territory. So now we have all these ingredients coming together. Now it's in the hands of, instead of a declining European uh, imperial uh, government, it's in the hands of an ascendant, business-oriented, expanding American nation. About nine years later, steamboat technology arrives, and the very first steamboat makes it down from the Pittsburgh area all the way down the river. And the benefit here is that the uh, steamboats can go up against the current. Now, there was some traffic against the current, the keelboats, very, very slow. They had to pole their way against, against going upriver, row, pole, grab onto bushes. But um, uh, steamboats solved this problem. So now you have all these commodities down. You have the right political and economic environment. You have this technology. And New Orleans booms. Very prominent people, including Jefferson, routinely point to New Orleans as the city of the future. It is predicted to become the most affluent and important place, some say in the nation, the hemisphere, even in the world. So what Chicago was to the early 20th century, what many people view Hong Kong to be kind of the gateway to, to Asia right now, or other cities in Asia, New Orleans was to the early 19th century. The city starts to boom. I'm, I don't know if you could see this in the back, but I'm going to show this graph a couple of times. This is the total population of the city. The yellow is the African ancestry population, both free and enslaved. The city had the most, in both absolute and relative terms for many years, free black population. Uh, and the blue is mostly white, but, but all other groups as well. So uh, you could see that right after the Louisiana Purchase, the population doubled in seven years, doubled again in 10 years, and then roughly doubled about every 15 years, almost up until the Civil War. Notice also that it went from a majority black to a majority white city right around 1830, 1840. The reason why is that this was, the, for many of those years, the number one immigration port to the South, and for many years, the number two in the nation behind New York. It was ahead of Boston, Philadelphia, Baltimore. It's kind of the, the major back door uh, into, uh, into the United States. Um, the immigration, uh, let me just briefly read this off to you here. Here's the Louisiana Purchase. Here's the Civil War. The main immigrant groups coming in, just like you see in the Northeast, Irish, German, What's a little bit different is the third largest was French immigrants. Now, these aren't French Creoles from the colonial era. These are directly from France. You don't really see that in the Northeast. Also, very high Spanish and Italian immigration, well before you see Italian immigration to, to Manhattan. You also have groups from Mexico, England, the Caribbean, Cuba. Uh, so a, uh, a rich um, kind of ethnic gumbo here. And with the, uh, particularly the Irish and German, most of the slavery within New Orleans was domestic slavery. And so uh, by 1830, 1840, many of those domestics were replaced with paid Irish and German maids. Um, and so that explains why you see that, that racial shift right around that era. Um, despite this booming environment, the city was plagued with um, uh, almost incessant disease, disaster, flooding, hurricanes, uh, particularly uh, yellow fever epidemics. And if you plot out all those natural and epi epidemiological disasters, they occur at a frequency of roughly, I would say, maybe two or three per decade, uh, almost every couple of years. Yet the city bounded back very, in a very resilient fashion after each one. So now after Katrina, it's helpful to go back and and ask what made New Orleans so remarkably resilient uh, during the uh, 19th century. For one thing, it occupied higher ground in higher densities. This is in the 1700s. This is in the early 1800s. Still, the vast majority of the population is living uh, uh, well above sea level, uh, closer to the river, and at higher density. So it took advantage of this natural geography, and it let these low-lying areas store water. When surge came in, you just let it stand there, and you have no one uh, suffering or flooding there. It just stores water. Uh, the city itself, the land base, lay almost entirely above sea level. 
Now, how many of you heard in the press that New Orleans, comma, a below sea level city, comma, I mean, you heard that incessantly after Katrina. That's half true and half false. The city straddles, currently straddles the level of the sea. Half of it is below to a degree of anywhere from four to 12 feet below, and it's, the other half is above um, from r roughly that same range. We are above sea level right now, um, so it's about 50-50. 300 years ago, it was 100% above sea level. Uh, the deltaic flame, remember how we explained how those sediments start accumulating? If anything was below sea level, it would have filled in with Gulf water and it would have been a tidal lagoon. Um, so it, uh, there was no, it wasn't bowl shaped at the time, and if it's not bowl shaped, it can't impound water the way Katrina did. I'll go into more detail about subsidence a little bit later on how it dropped below sea level. The city was buffered by far more and healthier wetlands. Uh, this was still a, a more or less a, a natural functioning system. Uh, the river would exceed uh, its uh, natural levees here and deposit sediment with new fresh water. It pushed back saltwater wedges and it kept building uh, wetlands here. So when a storm comes in, this land absorbs that storm surge and it keeps away from the metropolis. We've lost a lot of that wetlands. Uh, the levying of the Mississippi River had not yet con completely constrained it. So what we've done is at the crest of the natural levee, we've erected artificial levees to prevent those annual sort of nuisance floods from happening, that sheet of water from excess water in the river. Uh, the benefit of this is that you don't have to deal with annual spring flooding. The disadvantage is that is now you're choking off and severing that natural connection of the river to the wetlands. This, what you're looking at here, is the city's worst disaster until Katrina, the 1849 Salve Crevasse. Now, we are right around, right around here. Here's Lee Circle. Here's the original city, the French Quarter. Here, you can see where most of the population lived. Here's the flood footprint over here. And you can see that the flood footprint was mostly unoccupied land. Here's the crevasse. So there was an opening in the river here. Uh, about 10% of the city was flooded. Anyone know what percentage of, of the city's population was flooded by Katrina? 80% well, of the land area was flooded. 61% of the population was flooded. But in these times, the worst flood of the era, only 10% flooded because no one lived in the low-lying areas. Uh, I don't know of any deaths from the Sauvé crevasse. It might have even saved lives. There was a similar flood in 1816 where we definitely have records that the death rate that year actually went down. Now, how would that happen? How would a flood save lives? This back swamp was filled with stagnant water which bred mosquitoes. It was a dumping ground, uh, slaughterhouses, dumped animal carcasses there. It was filthy and it bred mosquitoes and it, bred, uh, it helped breed yellow fever. So by flushing it out with fresh water, it was actually kind of a spring cleaning. So, um, so floods are, are part of the, the natural cycle here, a, f a fairly quick recovery as, as well from that flood. Also at that time, we accommodated the possibility of, of water in the streets by building high, building sturdy. This building, as you probably see tomorrow, it's called Madame John's Legacy, it's built in 1788, about five feet above the grade level, and the grade is about eight feet above sea level, well protected. Three feet, about five, six feet above the grade level here. Uh, and most importantly, the city was economically ascendant. Uh, if you were of the right social strata here, you could do very well. Uh, the, in other words, the promise of opportunity trumped the possibility of risk. Now, of course, this does not apply to the whole population, particularly the enslaved portion. Um, now, here's a, this graph here. What you're looking at is 1810 to 1860, so the entire antebellum era over here. And these are shipments in tons coming down the river. Uh, and you could see that up until the 1820s, this blue line is shipments coming down the river to New Orleans. As low it, as it is, it's increasing. More importantly, it's a monopoly. If you're growing corn or raising hogs in Kentucky or Ohio, you really have no option except to come down the river and transship in New Orleans. But then in the 1820s, we start to see new competition here. So what's happening is the construction of the Erie Canal, other canals, and then railroads start to compete for Mississippi River traffic. Uh, 
New Orleans in the early years of that century had monopolistic control over that route, but now you, you, you're starting to see other options to get those commodities to northeastern markets. So, but even then, the pie is growing so big that New Orleans continues to boom here, but they're getting, unbeknownst to them, some knew it, but in the larger population did not appreciate they were getting a shrinking share of that pie. Now the next graph, you're looking at absolute numbers here. The next graph is relative numbers. Zero to 100%. In this era, New Orleans had almost 100% control of that, that business. And then with the railroads and the canals, it starts to decline. By the Civil War, it gets only about 50% of that business. Now you could spend the rest of your life trying to study and answer the question about why New Orleans declined from, from one of the most important cities in the nation to where it is today. But I would argue that this is probably the weightiest of those different variables, this loss of, of um, uh, diminishing importance of the Mississippi River. Now, there are many other issues, of course. I'm, I'm kind of quickly going over the Civil War, which of course, uh, and the, all the transformations occasioned by the war, racial and social and political strife during the Reconstruction era, uh, all also contributed to the relative decline of the city. But even then, particularly after the 1870s, when a, a series of jetties were built by Captain James Eads at the mouth of the river clearing out sediment there, the city once again rebounds again. And uh, this is a lithograph from that era. Here's Lee Circle, so we are sitting r literally right, right over there, I guess figuratively. Um, so here's the French Quarter over here. You could still see, even in the 1880s, that the, the city is clinging to that higher ground and the back swamp is largely empty. empty. Things start to change in the progressive era, 1890s, early 1900s. For one thing, levee construction now becomes a federalized task. Levees are uh, professionally built. Um, uh, the uh, uh, Mississippi uh, um, River Commission, the later Army Corps of Engineers, takes over this task and finally prevents those annual floodings. Electricity, telephones, streetcars, we start to see the emergence of a modern downtown. Wealthy people used to live in the inner city, but once these streetcar networks were put in and automobiles, they start to move out to the garden suburbs, present day Uptown, Elysian, uh, Esplanade Avenue. You see this in New York, you see this in Washington, Baltimore, same pattern here. Municipal water, first 200 years, People generally drank directly out of the Mississippi River or they collected rainwater in cistern up until only 100 years ago. 1905, a municipal water system, a modern system with uh, water treatment is finally installed in Carrollton and this, this also allows for a movement out of the inner city. Most importantly, a world-class municipal drainage system is installed to finally remove those swamp waters and standing water in the low-lying areas and the way it works is uses natural topography to drain water off the natural levee to a series of low points, and then it installs these gigantic propeller pumps um, that were perfected a little bit later, excavates a series of outfall canals, and then pumps the water over a man-made levee over here and then into Lake Pontchartrain and into surrounding water bodies. So this opens up the former swamps, and then we start to see a suburban expansion uh, so here's the original city. You see it spreading along the natural levee here. And then finally, between the 1890s and 1920s, you see those first incursions all the way to Lake Pontchartrain. Here's an, an, some other data here. These percentages are the percent increase or decrease in the population between 1920 or 1930. Negative 20, negative 43. The French Quarter declined by 25% increases in these lowlands by 1,500%, this is Lakeview, 400% increase, Gentilly, 636% increase. So there is a movement from the river toward the lake, from higher ground into lower ground. Why would you do this? Because of what we now see, an ill-placed faith in technology, in drainage and levees, that you know what? You don't have to worry about topography and hydrology anymore. Technology took care of that, now let's move into these new suburban environments. So here's New Orleans in the 1700s, 1800s. By 1910, you see a movement into the, off the natural levee. By 1930, still more. Now there is a, a racial component to this as well. 
Uh, what you're looking at here is a 1939 map, a distribution of um, white and black. Uh, the predominantly white areas are in these yellow to green shades, and predominantly black areas are in these bluish shades. Now, if you ignore everything I'm covering right here and focus on this, that is roughly the 19th century racial distribution of the city, where you have quite a bit of mixing, but a predominantly white front of town with some black pockets right along the river. These would be uh, families of longshoremen and dock workers uh, who have to live right next to the river. But mostly you see a black back of town and a white front of town. Uh, this would be a mostly Creole population, a fr Franco-African American. These would be mostly Anglo-African American, the descendants of emancipated slaves who moved to the city after the Civil War. But once this area is drained here, and developed for kind of suburbia, in many of those subdivisions, racist, blatantly racist deed covenants were put in, excluding black families from renting or owning. So what we see is kind of a leapfrogging of the white middle class over the black back of town into these low-lying areas over here. And that explains why Lakeview uh, is, uh, was, and is all white. Gentilly later became more diversified, but originally it was largely wide as well. And again, what's driving this is uh, a sense that we no longer had to worry about physical geography. Uh, by this time, the petroleum industry is ascendant uh, in the state and region, and shipping and navigation canals are being built because the port is in competition to try to win back some of that trade it lost. And so there's pressure on to make the port as efficient as possible. The industrial canal was excavated uh, around 1920, 1918 to 1923, to connect the river and lake and create more dock space. Uh, uh, about 15 years later, the Intracoastal Waterway was excavated for barge traffic. And then in the 50s and 60s, the Mississippi River Gulf Outlet Canal, MRGO, was excavated so that ships didn't have to come up the river. They have a straight shot from the Gulf into these port facilities here. There's also a multitude of oil and gas access canals. Uh, the river is no longer depositing sediment. There's natural subsidence. We have invasive species such as nutria that are eating the grass uh, and the wetlands exposing them to erosion. And the result is that all these areas in red and yellow have since disappeared between, and, and that's 18 years ago, so subtract even more. And instead of a dynamic, fluid, uh, healthy deltaic environment, we have a declining, uh, literally and figuratively declining and eroding one. Now, for an ecological standpoint, you could see the, the damage here, but from a human health standpoint, if you have a hurricane coming, every 2.7 horizontal miles of wetlands absorbs roughly one vertical foot of storm surge. So with a diminishing wetlands and land surface, surges could get closer and closer to the metropolitan area, which by the way is subsiding. This is 1895 elevation, and this is the same legend, and this is 2000, elevation in 2000. All these red areas have sunken below sea level. When you subtract one from the other, these, are, uh, these areas by the lake with the finest um, soil uh, particle size and the most organic matter have dropped uh, from uh, four to six to eight feet. Um, now the reason this happens is uh, when you install the levees and build in the drainage system, you're removing the water component from the soil body. And this allows uh, uh, crevices to open up, it allows uh, organic matter to rot, and the particles fill in the gaps and the land surface drops. So imagine pushing down on a bucket of wet towels compared to a bucket of dry towels. You could push a whole lot lower on the dry towels. So if you take a profile of the city from the river to the lake, this is what that profile would have looked like 100 years ago. This is what it looks like today. So if you have water on top of the surface, instead of simply draining off into Lake Pontchartrain, now it is trapped. So this is the uh, elevation of New Orleans today. Uh, green is above sea level, yellow is roughly at sea level, and red is below sea level. So if you need to convince yourself of the relationship between levees and subsidence, there's a levee along here, there's a levee along here, 
on the wild side, outside the levee system, where animals live, it's above sea level. Where humans live, it's dropped five feet or more below sea level. So it's kind of a sobering lesson of trading off uh, the convenience of the present and immediate future for a long-term damage. Um, here's another shot. This is along the Lake Pontchartrain shore here. Uh, notice if you draw a line from the water level to the land level, you could see that it was slightly above, just like any beach environment. Uh, and if you stood at this same spot today, you'd be about eight feet uh, lower. This is what subsidence looks like in the landscape. Uh, officials are raising levees to account for it. We're not talking uh, a millimeter a century. We're talking about five millimeters per year in certain areas. Uh, so it is a serious problem. Now, the good news is that it tends to be front-loaded. When you first install the apparatus of drainage and levee and flood control, most of the subsidence happens up front, and then the pace slows down. Uh, but it, it very much is a serious problem here. So when we look at the spread of the population and suburbanization, 1939, 1960, the, the yellow is the African American, the white, uh, blue is the white population. And then uh, Hurricane Betsy flooding in 1965 affected these mostly empty areas there. You would think that would convince people not to move there, but afterwards uh, funds were sent down to better protect that area. Better protection means the real estate values go up, which means developers come in and they urbanize the areas. Very counterintuitive levy effect. And by 2000, that area is populated with tens of thousands of people. So we see a shift not only horizontally, but vertically in that the population, I'm not going to read this too closely here, this is sea level. The population has shifted its distribution from above sea level to below sea level areas. Worse yet, we abandoned the historical tradition of building high and replaced them with building ranch houses on concrete slabs at grade level. Here, a puddle in the street is not your problem. Here, a puddle is in the street is a puddle in your living room. Overconfidence in technology. The population peaks in 1960. We see the same middle class uh, white and then middle class black later exodus into suburban areas and the city starts to decline in population. Uh, the port becomes mechanized, port jobs start to disappear, oil and gas relocates to Houston, and by the turn, the end of the 20th century, it is mostly a struggling, poor service economy uh, over-dedicated to the tourism sector. So here's the population uh, trend uh, dropping off there, and if you look in terms of relative rank, the city was the third largest in the nation in 1840, and then uh, after 1960 starts to plummet. Today, after Katrina, it's around 65, 67th largest in the nation. So these problems were well known locally, but they weren't well known nationally or internationally, largely because they were masked by the mystique of New Orleans. The Mardi Gras, the music, the food, these problems were kind of behind the curtain. 34 months ago, the, so to speak, the, the curtain was ripped back and Category 5 storm is approaching straight north. And now remember the MRGO canal we talked about and the Intracoastal Waterway. They have guide levees, so you have this surge of water increasing 14 to 16 feet above normal levels. These are all man-made waterways that are penetrating the metropolis here. Uh, stage rises on the industrial canal, some levees start to breach, they overtop uh, the MRGO levees and are right up against the Lower Ninth Ward in St. Bernard Parish by 5 a.m. on Katrina morning. By this time the storm is a weakening Category 3 or Category 2, but it has a residual Category 5 storm surge. Off of Biloxi the waters are 29 feet above their normal levels. 29 feet, just imagine that. So the surge is continuing to come in, it overtops, and, and this is the, one of the few known photos of the water uh, coming. This was taken right here looking south. You see that fence? That's along the levee. So this is plus 16 water pouring into a basin that is as low as about 12 feet below sea level. And by 6.30 a.m., all of New Orleans East is underwater, almost all of it. Uh, 650, um, a breach opens up on the industrial canal and starts to fill this hydrological basin. And then 745, a catastrophic breach opens in the flood wall in the lower ninth ward. 
and starts to violently flood this area at the same time that the water is overtopping this back levee here. Uh, this is a photo a friend of mine took at Jackson Barracks with the Louisiana National Guard in the Lower Ninth Ward before the breach, during the breach. This is just before. Now the, the next photo, look at the roof of this car here. And he's above sea level when he took this picture. So imagine what it's like um, in negative two, negative three areas. You would add about five feet to that. This is within about 20 to 30 minutes. So by 8.30 a.m., water in this particular basin is all the way up to the very highest areas around. And by this time, New Orleanians are perishing by the score, uh, oftentimes in their own houses, in their own attics. Remember the outfall canals we talked about that were excavated for the drainage system? They start to fail a little bit later in the morning. Orleans, the London Avenue, and then uh, most infamously the Lakeview outfall canal, I mean the 17th Street Canal in Lakeview, another catastrophic breach starts to flood that area. The London Avenue Canals worsen, and by the, by the time Katrina is passed, unbeknownst to many of the people in this area, the bowl is filling in, and it would continue to fill in for the next couple of days because the water, the Gulf is still bloated, and it's pouring into the city. So by Thursday, the water backs out to the Gulf of Mexico, and now the city is this isolated bowl of water surrounded by dry, uh, now dry land. In Mississippi, Florida, when a hurricane hits there, it washes on, it washes off. You wash on to a subsided area, it stays on for days, weeks. And so when we look at the historic footprint of the city here, this is 1878, and we overlay the flood footprint, you see how the very area that flooded is uh, almost precisely area that was not developed until the drainage system uh, encouraged the development of those areas. And here's an oblique view of the metropolis here and the extent of the flooded footprint here. Now I'm going to jump ahead and kind of conclude on this note of, of where we are now. It's a very hard thing to to give a, a quick answer to. Um, but um, now with the problem of the actual failures that occurred during Katrina, the levees were too low, they didn't account for subsidence, uh, the flood wall pilings, the failures, um, most of the, uh, all of the breaches have been fixed to, to a, a reasonable degree. If anything, uh, they are now better protected than the areas that did not breach so that if we have high water again, it might actually put pressure on some of the areas that, that did well during Katrina. Uh, other levees are being raised to, uh, to modern conditions, also accounting for sea level rise, by the way. Uh, the bad news here is that the navigation canal funnel is still open. That's the MRGO Intracoastal Waterway V. Uh, the good news is that the outfall canals, um, the drainage canals, have been gated. Uh, so water will not enter as uh, nearly as freely if we have a hurricane this season or next. Now the contract has just been let out to install a gate at the, at the V there and that's promised to be delivered by this time next year. So hopefully by next hurricane season the main failure points will at least have these temporary protections on them. But make no mistake, the real solution to this problem, I mean, levees and gates, this is, this is chemotherapy. The real cancer, the real problem here is coastal erosion. And so the real solution is getting that sediment out of the river and that fresh water and start replicating as much as we can that natural system. Water Resources Development Act was authorized. The money has not yet been allocated. These are very complex re restoration projects and there are a lot of legal issues uh, involved, but, but this is definitely the solution. Bad news here, the sea level is rising, as you know, with global warming. <clears throat> the good news is that we, unlike many other coastal cities, have a weapon to confront this, and that is the world's greatest land building machine, the Mississippi River. Uh, other cities that are also in coastal environments don't have this. So when the river builds wetlands, it builds them at sea level, wherever that sea level is. Uh, recovery is slow, that's the bad news, but it's also quite normal. This is a study from the NSF did in the 1970s that looks at time in weeks after a disaster. This is a logarithmic scale here, so this is days, weeks, and then we're in hundreds of weeks here, or years. 
and this is the magnitude of certain coping activities. They found that most urban disaster, disasters, within one to two weeks, uh, the, all the bodies are picked up and, and you start to... Now, how long were we collecting bodies here after Katrina? It was months. It was into 2006. So that's the first wave. Restoration, getting back to functionality, is usually 10 times longer than that first phase. So if this took four months, then we should expect 40 months over here. Replacement, getting back to where you were just before the catastrophe, is oftentimes 100 times that first phase. And then actually improving the situation is oftentimes hundreds of times longer than here. So if you plot out the magnitude of Katrina, all of a sudden it looks like not only this is a long, long journey, but where one could say that the city is doing fairly well. This is not the popular narrative. The popular narrative is that we're way behind the curve and this is, uh, you know, no one's doing their job and it's, it's a lazy backward city. I, I would see this as uh, quite normal. It's, it's within, within the, the bell-shaped curve here. The flooded regions are still largely depopulated. Well, that, that varies. Uh, citywide, about 70% of New Orleans proper is back. Uh, in terms of the whole region, depending on how you map it, it's about 90 to 95. Um, the flooded areas, depending on two main variables, the level, the amount of damage and the pre-Katrina socioeconomics, they are back in a range of anywhere from about 40 to 60 percent. The exception is the lower Ninth Ward. The higher areas there are back by about 25 to 30 percent, and the worst hit areas I'm not sure if, this, if you're taking a tour of the Lower Ninth Ward, but if you go to the area right by the, the levee breach, it's about 7 to 10% back there. This is where the Make It Right Foundation is looking to build its sustainable homes. This is the, um, the Brad Pitt project. Uh, I'd like to conclude just on what needs to happen to save New Orleans. And like I've said before, it's opening up diversions and crevasses in the river in a controlled manner to get that sediment out uh, and back on the, on the wetlands. The one major problem there is that we have a whole lot less sediment in the river now because we've erected so many dams and locks and control structures on the river upstream and the tributaries, we have less sediment here. So you have to actually go down to the bottom of the river and mine sediment like a mineral, like a mineral resource, which is exactly what it is, and then siphon it out onto the wetland surface. Um, so if you look at this graph here, we want to insert as many um, physical obstacles, be they wetlands, barrier islands, transportation routes, and then finally levees here. We also want to build high, and then the local population has to incorporate the notion of evacuation uh, into their, into their, uh, their functionality. Um, so on, on that note, I think there's... Um, there's a lot to be optimistic about. I'm, I'm not one to sugarcoat. I, I love the city, but I'm, I'm not a, um, uh, a mindless activist. I, I, I believe in, in calling these things uh, as I see them. And I do think that this is not only a solvable problem, but also a problem worth solving. So with that, I will wrap it up, and thank you.